I'm going to see if I can juggle uh, all of these things in the same hand for a while. Um, I'm not that dexterous, though. So one, I'd like to, to thank everybody um, for the work that you all are doing. Uh, it's tremendous. I'd like to thank Pro Kids and uh, the courts and, and everyone who uh, made this possible. Um, so a, bit of, a, bit of, a little bit about my background. So I started uh, really getting interested in issues um, dealing with kids in the juvenile court. I did a, uh, I did a, I'm sorry, I thought you were going to ask a question. We're going to get there in one sec. No, I'm sorry. So uh, I did a, I did a, um, a course in, juven in a juvenile clinic at Ohio State. And there I was able to work with kids uh, facing misdemeanor issues. Um, I got a chance to represent a few kids in court. And, and, you know, what I saw, you know, what I was able to experience was just so harrowing that, you know, anytime I had the opportunity to really engage, you know, on an issue like this, I'm always going to take it. And so, uh, you know, the reason, though, I had the opportunity is because of all of the work that you all are doing. And so, again, thank you. So um, just a couple of things to start. I, th I think I can leave that there, right, and get it closed. I don't know. I was just keeping it in my hand. So a, a few things before we start. One, a lot of the data that we're going to present today, uh, we're framing this in broad strokes, right? And so uh, there can be things that uh, you're going to look at and say, well, maybe there's a counterfactual here, there's a counterfactual there. Uh, we're really trying to get to the end. We're really trying to paint a picture. And then two, um, I think it's important that we're all transparent. I'm going to be as transparent as I can be uh, while I'm up here. And I think that you know, we, we move this conversation forward a lot more quickly um, if we really bring what we have to the table. And so, um, you know, let, I guess let's get started. So I'd like to, I'd like to start this off with, uh, with this question. So this was a quote from a philosopher, Lud, Ludwig Wittgenstein, um, in a book called Philosophical Investigations. And he posed the question, if a lion could talk, we could not understand him. So uh, I, I just, I'll take one comment, and we'll, we'll pass the mic around. Does anybody have an idea on what this means? Because again, we're here to talk about the power of perspective, right? And so I think this, uh, this gets us going in the right direction. So does anybody have an idea uh, on what this quote may mean? Somebody has to have an idea. Okay, right. So they can't speak English, right? So, so the way that we engage with people, right, is through language. And the, and the language that we use is informed by our perspective, where we come from, where we grow up, um, what, we've, what we've gone through up to this point. And so, for instance, you know, well, in my current condition, I'm not doing anything close to what a lion would do. Right, but I'm not hunting for my food. I'm not, you know, sleeping on the on the Sahara. I'm not doing any of that. And so, even if we could speak the same language, uh, we wouldn't be able to understand each other. So, next question. So, say that um, my entire life, the only experience that I've ever had with water is in this cup. Somebody takes me to the ocean. Can I extrapolate that, or can I take the experience that I've had with water here and then sort of understand how water works uh, in the ocean? Okay, I, oh, I like this. We're getting engaged already. So why or why not? Right. And so, right, so we're looking at, you know, how the earth spins. We're looking at the, the water temperatures and the currents. We're looking at the topography of the ocean. It's a lot of stuff, right? So I, one of the things I like to do in presentations is or, or use cool graphics, and so hopefully these aren't too nerdy. So, you know, what we have, right, we have the topography, we have the access, we have the moon, et cetera. And so we think about issues of race. You know, we, we hear hot button issues. You know, somebody has been shot. Something has happened. This group of people, you know, are experiencing this. But we posit, though, we, we see the wave. And the wave is really just the last portion of a, of a systemic process that occurred a lot further out. And so what we're here to do today is really walk back, you know, what this systemic process looks like, some of the things that go into it. And then we're able to, to, we're able to take kids, right, who have, who have only been able to experience water in a cup and we understand why, you know, sometimes it's, it's not easy, you know, for folks to understand how water works um, in the ocean. So here are our objectives today. To explore the diversity of Cincinnati and Hamilton County through opportunity mapping and data framing. Um, to discover the root causes uh, affecting barriers to opportunity. And then finally to develop an action plan. And so I would say that the, the third point is so funny. I'm, I, keep, like, I just want to keep pointing this stuff. Like, <laughs> and I can't. I'm like, my, my flipper ain't working. So, <laughs> so the last thing that we're going to do is develop an action plan. And so I think this is really one of the most important parts of what we're going to do here today, is what can we take away from this conversation? Um, 
a lot of the a lot of the dialogue around diversity and race, uh, I think, includes a lot of high level uh, talk, a lot of jargon, a lot of things that sometimes go over our heads, sometimes things that we can't really appreciate or identify with because it's not our lived reality. And so my goal here today is that everybody brings their individual perspective to the table because diversity, embracing diversity, means that we embrace perspectives um, and that we can't just stop you know, with anyone. And so usually with these things, I really like engagement because I would rather hear 100 opinions and not just mine. Um, unfortunately, you know, we're going we're gonna to save that sort of for the back end, but I'm really excited you know, for the last part uh, to see what we can do. So um, to give you guys a little bit of background about what we do at Kerwin, um, this is basically uh, a graphic showing the, the domains that we work in, education, public health, um, sustainable communities, and criminal justice. Um, a lot of the ways that we frame issues around race, uh, you can see here um, at the top, structural racialization and race and cognition. So structural racialization means um, institutions work together in society to produce racialized outcomes. And so this means that um, while, we, while we're going to look at some trends, we're going to look at what's happening around Cincinnati and Hamilton County, this isn't necessarily ascribing right blame to any particular group of people or any particular policy. This is just saying that institutions work together uh, to produce outcomes that we know uh, work along racial lines. And then secondly, race and cognition. So this is how does race work in our mind? Um, and we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. So uh, one, of the, one of the other things that we do at Kerwin is called opportunity mapping. And so if you can, can everybody see the... Uh, see this uh, slide, the graphic on the left. So we, we categorize these in three, in three domains, educational opportunity, health and physical environment, and neighborhood and social uh, economic opportunity. And so you can see, for instance, one of the, uh, under neighborhood and social, we have the foreclosure rate, health and physical environment, we have proximity to health facilities, and then edu educational opportunity, excuse me, we have student poverty rates in local schools. And so uh, if, you, if you look at this, one of the things that's not on here is race. And so race isn't a component, you know, as we're, as we're gathering this data. And so it's going to be interesting, right, for, the, for this next slide. So what we have here is an opportunity map of Hamilton County and Cincinnati. And so um, the darker areas, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to yell for a second. So the darker areas here indicate higher opportunity. And so this means that, you know, within the domains we just talked about, um, education, health and physical, or neighborhood, <coughs> that these are going to rank higher. And so we take a lot of this data from the census. And so you can see um, here would be an area of low opportunity, uh, you know, intermediate opportunity, et cetera. And so then, uh, so just another quick question. Does any, can anybody identify uh, the areas you think that have the lowest opportunity? Where, where is this? Downtown. Downtown. Okay. So... What we have here now are three different opportunity maps that are, that are uh, detailing the racial distribution um, of, of folks living in Cincinnati. So on the left, we have uh, the white, uh, non-Hispanic population. And so you can see the larger blue dots were about 1,000 1, to 5,000 uh, residents. And so you can see sort of the distribution right across the county. Um, we can also see here, right, relatively low. Um, as we move to our next map, we have the African-American population in Cincinnati. And so you can see here, right, very clustered um, in areas that, that we would describe as having low opportunity. Um, and then here we have the uh, Hispanic Latino population. And this is actually an interesting trend because this is, uh, we see the same data in Columbus as well. And so um, Latino or Hispanic population actually uh, is sort of more dispersed than the African American or the white population. And so, you know, you see in some areas of high opportunity, also areas of low opportunity. So does this, does this strike anyone as, as odd or... Not right. Uh, any, any intuitive? So I'm not from Cincinnati, right? And so really, what we're I'm going to rely on you all to help, you know, fill this skeleton in. Any insightful comments? All right. Yes, ma'am. Okay. That's that's a very good question. So when you're going to see an area of high opportunity. What you're going to see is you're going to see uh, very, you know, close proximity to health facilities. Um, you're going to see a lot of uh, healthy food. Um, you're, not going to, you're going to see a low poverty rate, uh, a low foreclosure rate. Um, you're going to see a very low student, uh, a rate of student uh, poverty in school. And so it's, it's really a, it's, it's a scale, right? So it could be, you could have an area of high opportunity that has maybe intermediate opportunity in health, then high opportunity in neighborhood, social, economic, and uh, educational indicators. 
And so opportunity stands for the, really stands for the broader concept of, you know, so when you're driving through um, some of the suburbs of Cincinnati, what do you see? Um, you're not going to see necessarily the signs of, you're not going to see a lot of vacancies. You're going to see some healthy food places. Uh, you're going to see the sorts of things that we expect, you know, in, in affluent areas. And so um, it's, 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 it's a technical definition based on the metrics, but really we can think about it more intuitively, right? And so if we can, you know, we, we'll go to uh, some of the area, I think over the Rhine, right, is, is uh, historically um, high poverty, uh, high vacancy, et cetera. And so when you're, when you're going through there, you have this gut feeling that, you know, this is an area perhaps that hasn't had a lot of investment in it. What does that investment lead to? the source of opportunities, you know, that, that sometimes we take for granted uh, because we, we live in uh, higher opportunity areas. So I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a technical definition, also part intuitive, um, but maybe that wasn't a great definition, but we're going to keep going. We're going to walk you through it. So, all right, so here we have, so now we're going to start looking at data um, Hamilton County wide, and then we're going to start to drill down uh, into uh, Cincinnati. So our first slide that we have here um, again, it's looking at the racial distribution of Hamilton County. We kind of went through that. And so, you know, as we, as we look at this, right, in context of the opportunity maps, we're going to see that uh, it sort of lines up uh, as we would expect. And then this last slide is also just showing um, the racial distribution. Then we have education. Um, this slide set, this, this is looking at uh, Hamilton County school district standards met. So what, where, what school district is this in Hamilton County? Cincinnati, Cincinnati Public, right? And then uh, this slide looks at the Hamilton County uh, Schools four-year graduation rate. Um, what kind or what, what school district is that? Also Cincinnati Public, right? And so as we move through this thing, so if your question about what does opportunity look like, we're, I'm really going to try to walk you through sort of in various ways, through various statistics, um, what that what that looks like. And so is this surprising to anyone? What do the colors mean? So the colors basically indicate um, that they, they fail to meet the, the district standard. And so it's, it's kind of a heat map in the sense that, so here it says 66 to 84 percent, right, uh, did not graduate, or 66 to 84 percent graduated, you know, within the four-year time frame. And so the red is saying that, you know, the, the rate is, is relatively worse than the other rates of, of other school districts in the county. So which ones are good? So, so you can see here the green is 95.41 uh, to 99.4. So we have Sycamore Local, uh, we have Madeira, uh, Kent, Marymount perhaps. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, is it, so intuitively, right, we can walk through this thing intuitively because we're gonna see this and sort of understand, we, this is what we see, right? But now we're, we're putting some data on it. And so again, it's, you know, so what's good or bad, right? It's kind of a relative question. And so I would say that it's relative to sort of other school district graduation rates. So here we have, uh, this is an interesting uh, slide. It's a lot of data, don't, don't worry about <laughs> most of what's on here. Um, what we want to focus on now is the ethnicity um, on, the, on the left hand side um, of, the, of the data. And so what you can see here, so we'll look at, for instance, let's look at Madeira, right? And so in some, in some categories, there's not sort of not a lot of racial diversity. Uh, we can move to Winton Woods. Um, looks like there's uh, a lot more racial diversity. Cincinnati City, obviously a lot more. Um, Princeton City, a lot more. Is this surprising? Yeah. Okay, can somebody tell, because I, again, I'm not from here, I need somebody to tell me why. Why is it surprising? Pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. Those communities that you listed are like homogeneous and who lives in them. So mm -hmm. they'll be homogeneous and <coughs> kids that go to school and some of them are more diverse. Mm -hmm. Right, and so, Right, so in this, in this instance, there's definitely a, a bit of racial segregation uh, in our schools, but also spatial segregation, right? Also a bit of economic segregation. And so this is, again, just kind of the portrait. This is, this is where we live right here in Cincinnati. Uh, this, is, this is what the data is telling us. And so, again, you know, the, the second slide stands for the same proposition we have here. Wynton Woods, um, Mount Healthy, uh, looks like that's a little bit more. So we'll, we'll continue to move through this. And so these next slides, um, so schools with 75% or more economically disadvantaged students. Again, Cincinnati, right? So we're, we're, just, we're gonna continue to drive this point home. So this is Cincinnati, right? And then you can see sort of the distribution um, in, in our outlying areas. The next slide is schools located in areas with 10% or more unemployment. Is this shocking to anyone? 
So uh, one of the things that, actually I've had the opportunity to work with uh, Senator Shannon Jones on infant mortality at the State House in Columbus. And so uh, infant mortality is a big issue. Uh, you know, infant mortality is actually an indicator of, of social health um, in communities. And so we can see here, uh, or we can see, we'll get to infant mortality, but we can see life expectancy. And so as you move through Hamilton County, uh, we move through, you know, females, males, et cetera, uh, black life expectancy at birth and white life expectancy at birth. And this, is two, uh, this data is coming from 2001 to 2009. Excuse me. So we can see here uh, life expectancy at birth for black females, 72 years, for black males, 63. Um, white life expectancy at birth, 76.5 uh, is the average, uh, 79 for women and 74 for men. Is this, is this surprising anyone? So as we think about the power of perspective, right, so I'm putting myself into the, the shoes of a kid um, who lives in Cincinnati. And so if what you're saying, you know, you can't necessarily put your finger on it because you may not have the data, but what you're going to experience, you know, is the loss of life, you know, much more often, either through decreased life expectancy, through infant mortality, uh, through gun violence, etc. And so think about sort of the, the, how that plays in the mind of a, of a young man or a young woman as they're developing. So infant mortality. Uh, so here, so infant mortality is defined as 1,000 uh, deaths per 1,000 live births. And so we have an infant mortality distribution, right, of Hamilton County, uh, and then the outline here is Cincinnati. And so in some, in some areas, we have 24, a rate of 24.2, so that's 24 deaths per 1,000 live births. Uh, other outline count or outline areas, you have rates of 6.8, 3.7, 4.9, 4.8. Is this surprising to anyone? Somebody has to be surprised about something. <laughs> no, nobody is? Okay. Well, and so I'll, I'll take this point to editorialize just a bit. Interesting, right, that, that this is not shocking anyone because on some level this means that, you know, this data has become normalized. You know, that we expect in some instances, you know, that this is sort of the norm, right? And so this is, the, this is the power of perspective, right? And so just, just as easily as we can point to an area that's increasing or experiencing a rate of 30.4, 30 deaths per 1,000 live births. So with the infant mortality rate, is that births, like, when, on the map, when they're counting that, is that births in that jurisdictional area, or is that where the, where the people actually live? So for example, there are hospitals in certain areas, and so you're going to have more births at that hospital, but that's not necessarily where people live. I mean, they may live in a different part of the map. So right. Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, I, didn't, I didn't create this map, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume a few things to, to answer this. So uh, again, so I'm, I'm assuming that most of this data is coming from uh, the Cincinnati Department of Health. And so what they're going to be drawing from are two things, probably the, the uh, address of the mother. And so then by linking the address of the mother to a specific geographical location, then we can look at the rates because then we can compare that to uh, the birth across the county. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Question? Yes, sir. Do you know how these rates, um, the infant mortality rates, compare to so-called third world countries as well as the Western countries? Very good question. Yes, sir. So, uh, so I did a TED talk. I did TEDx Columbus on infant mortality. And I was, just, I was deciding, you know, should I in, include some of these uh, numbers, some of these comparisons, right? And so you would see a, so a rate of about 30.4, that's, that's going to be double Palestine, probably going to be double uh, Rwanda, going to be double other third world countries. And so our infant mortality rates actually in some pockets here in Ohio are, are far and above, what, you know, uh, rates that we would compare to what we call third world countries. And so... Uh, Ohio actually was the fifth worst state last year in terms of infant mortality. Ohio spends about $55 billion around the state each year to abate infant mortality. Um, and that's a, that's a lot of money, and you know, I, I won't uh, rehash the TED talk, but there's other areas that we can invest in, and I think that's what we're talking about now, right? There's something called the social determinants of health, um, which basically include um, health and, your access to health and health care, your personal network, the built environment, your personal finance, and uh, the level of education that you have. And so 70% of all health outcomes can be explained in some way by those five social determinants that I just listed, and which also sounds very eerily similar, right, to the, to the opportunity domains that we listed earlier. So, you know, we're, so we, we walked through a little bit of poverty, we walked through a little bit of education, we walked through a little bit of, of other data, right? So here, 30.4, a lot of, lot of 
stuff happening in that neighborhood. And so uh, we'll walk into the other graphics on here. So looking at the percent distribution of uh, births and infant deaths by race and ethnicity of the mother, um, here we have, uh, we have births um, from, here are the births from uh, white mothers. We have 57.8, so 57.8 of all births around Hamilton County are, are births to white mothers, and then 36.8 are births to black mothers. 58.1% of all infant mortality in Hamilton County is experienced by black mothers uh, within the county. And so then here's just another uh, graphic depicting that. Any, yes sir? Could you define infant for this study? Is that so that's uh, within the first year of life. First year. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we're gonna, we're gonna drill down on Cincinnati a little bit more. So here we have um, areas, again, education designated by uh, high crime activity. And so you can see high crime activity in this, uh, in this slide is uh, defined by schools are designated in areas of high crime activity. There are more than 200 crimes reported within one quarter of a mile of school property in 2007. And so you can see here, right, we, we have a number of schools that, that fit that uh, measure. And we're going to get back to the graduation gap because I, this is something that I really wanted to talk about. Uh, I really like what we see there. And so then this last slide, um, 2010, you can see basically the dropout statistics by race uh, in Cincinnati. And also, so this is, this is very curious, right? A lot of uh, uh, black students dropping out in ninth grade, a lot of white students dropping out um, in 12th grade, and the rate is almost the same. And so this, you know, this is a very interesting question, what's happening here? So then we can, we're gonna take a second to look at the achievement gap. And so um, the achievement gap, basically these colors are, are looking at a different racial or ethnic group. Um, we have uh, white and blue here. Oh, I'm about to break the TV. We have white and blue here, um, also in math. And you see the graduation rate is uh, multiracial students. Actually, have the highest graduation rate in Cincinnati. And so you can see here. So this can the achievement gap just in reading and math. We have uh, you know comparing different ethnic groups. So we we closed a bit of the the graduation gap, right? But there's also this question of the achievement gap um, that we're looking at. What what constitutes multiracial? Uh. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Uh, two or probably two or more races, I would assume. Um, but for the purposes of of any race. I guess um, how how much of the population does that account for? I, I would assume that it's not. I mean, it's probably a lower percentage right. than the other populations um, that you that, that we've seen here. But I'm not exactly sure the the exact distribution um, of population. So, but again, right, so what we're focusing on are the broad strokes of these things. And so, you know, really just trying to help paint this picture. And so you can see here um, the, on the right, you have uh, the U.S. cities with the highest percentage of children living in poverty. Um, you can see uh, number three is Cincinnati with 48%. <coughs> so we'll just, I'm going to walk through this quickly because I know we're, we got to get to the next section. So we'll look at zero tolerance policy for one sec. So you can see here, uh, Cincinnati Public School disciplinary action by race and gender. Um, walk through that uh, black, male, non-Hispanic um, uh, discipline the most. Uh, and then I thought this was super interesting, preschool suspensions. <laughs> now, you know, I was, I'm not sure what I was doing in preschool. Hopefully, I, you know, not enough to get suspended. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very, that's also a very interesting statistic. And so, is, it, is, this, is this illustrative to anybody? Is this, is this any new information? Yeah. And is this also, and so I want it to be new information, but I also <coughs> want it to be feeding back into what you know already about Cincinnati. This is a, this is a very intuitive presentation. Um, I'm trying to just help show that, you know, if, if you've had a gut feeling driving somewhere, a gut feeling in a certain place, right, that maybe there's something amiss here, you know, the data is saying that there, there are things, right? There, there, there are things that are happening that, that we can put on. So life expectancy and infant mortality. Um, one, of the, one of the most interesting uh, presentations I ever did was in Baltimore. And in Baltimore, um, there was literally a gap, right, of life expectancy. If you went maybe uh, 10, 10 miles north of Baltimore City, the, the gap uh, rose 30 years, from 90 to 60. And so that goes back to the other slide that we were talking about, right, in the beginning, the life expectancy slide. And so again, just you know, showing you this in a different way. Uh, Cincinnati neighborhoods, life expectancy by median family income. Uh, the, the poorer you are, the shorter you live. Basically what this slide stands for. Uh, Cincinnati infant mortality rates by zip code, again, uh, you know, crazy, crazy, crazy figures. 
Uh, so housing and poverty. So the ten, the ten uh, poorest neighborhoods in Cincinnati are within the circle. So Bay Apartments, uh, Winton Hills, Over the Rhine, West End. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I told you I love the game. I'm waiting for somebody to jump in. Um, so you can see here, uh, this was a two cities uh, report created by the Greater Cincinnati Urban League, um, looking at sort of the median household income uh, between whites and blacks. We have African African Americans at 24,000, whites around 57,000. Life expectancy again. Uh, so where do the poor live in Cincinnati? Or where do the poor live in the region, excuse me? Um, you can see here, right, 33.5%, outpacing almost by double uh, the closest. Um, Cincinnati, most foreclosed properties, uh, you know, we can walk through that, vacancies, et cetera. So we can see that, again, housing, housing is very important. So to your question about uh, opportunity, ma'am, uh, you know, we can see, again, the visual depiction of opportunity or the lack thereof through looking at uh, these, these <laughs> did, you, did you take into account um, subsidized housing when you were looking at housing and the availability of subsidized housing? Uh, so can you, can you uh, I used to work point towards? Before. Okay. And one of the things that actually, one of the things that we did recently, well, they did recently, was take um, a whole Hamilton County survey um, of the housing stock, what was available uh, per the code, and actually it was done by census track. Um, so what was available, what were the average um, conditions of the properties, they were randomly sampled, and um, how much the um, uh, rent was. Mm -hmm. And then that data was compared to the distribution of use of subsidized housing um, throughout the county. And it, it, it had some very interesting findings. I was just curious, when you're looking at from your perspective, when you're looking at housing, are you considering subsidized housing as a component of how you're evaluating housing? So, that, so, so, to, so most of the slides that we, were most of the graphics, excuse me, that we pulled together are really sort of being drawn from reports that we found in Cincinnati, um, the Cincinnati Sun, or excuse me, uh, the Cincinnati Inquirer, et cetera. So most of the data is not necessarily things that we've produced, not really other than the opportunity mapping, okay. are not things that we've produced. And so the reason that, you know, the reason that I'm, you know, hopefully throwing a lot of stuff at you is because it's going to go back into this opportunity framework that we're going to get to uh, probably in a, in a few slides from here. Um, and so, you know, what I do know about subsidized housing, um, not, it's probably hard to get zoned, you know, in, in some areas outside of uh, the city for it. Not, not necessarily. Okay. Well, see, I, told, I, I don't know Cincinnati. <laughs> so you gotta, you gotta keep me, you gotta, you gotta keep me honest. I appreciate that. So here we have a, uh, a um, trend map, right, of crime in Cincinnati over uh, the 2005 to 2014. We can see that crime in, so we can see that crime has generally been trending down um, in Cincinnati, you know, for the last uh, nine years or so. Is this surprising to anybody that the crime is trending downwards? Okay, why? Well, it's so interesting. Let's talk about that a little bit. It's like whatever you turn the news on, there's some, yeah. it's more crime than it is good news. Mm -hmm. And so, again, I, I really like because it's about perspective, right? It's and about the perspective. Yes, like yeah, and to that point, and they're usually comparing it to the numbers <coughs> for the previous year up to that point, mm -hmm. and it always seems to be higher than, mm -hmm. you know. So, with them saying it, they're right. saying it's higher. Is that perspective? Am I supposed to be right? And so, so it, it is a perspective, you know. That, I mean, so factually, it might be correct, right? But if we look at the trends, the the overall trend is telling us that crime is going down. And so, I would say that that, that would be the perspective, probably, um, that we would want to highlight, but not, you know, not for the purposes of this uh, presentation, but just in general. So, uh, we have a number of stops by race in Cincinnati trending downward. Um, police use of force uh, also trending downward, and then number of arrestees also trending downward. And so even though we, we see these trends, right, there's still, there's still the disparity right in here, and also the disparity in infant mortality. And so, again, what is our perspective? This is, this is really good. Uh, I, we were reading a lot about um, what Cincinnati, uh, the police department, has done since 2001, right? A lot of incredible efforts. Institutional change or institutional perspectives, a different perspective, right, an opportunity perspective can change, uh, can change the race that we see. Um, so this is this is one of the most also one of the most interesting slides, and I think we're going to go back to opportunity mapping from there. So this is uh, the likelihood, or so I'll just read this. How rates different? So uh, USA Today analyzed FBI crime stats for 2011-2012 uh, to compare arrest rates for blacks and whites. 
By measuring arrest rates against the racial makeup of the population, uh, U.S. Today calculated the number of arrestees or arrest per thousand black and non-black residents for 3,800 uh, 3, communities nationwide. And so now we're looking at uh, what they did for Cincinnati. And so where, where is Sharon? I'm not, I'm not sure where Sharon is. North. 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 So an African-American uh, driving uh, in Sharonville is 11.9 uh, times more likely to get stopped uh, than their racial counterpart. You can see here the national median is around 2.6, right? The average stop for African-Americans compared to other groups. Um, here's our median. Is this surprising? OK. And so again, right, we, we, we're going to continue to put ourselves in the perspectives of kids that, that are experiencing this, right? So it might be your father, it might be your mom, it might be your cousin, brother, uncle, aunt, etc. This matters, right? This matters in, in, in their perspective. Who are we engaging with? How are we engaging? How are we engaging with law enforcement? How are we engaging with the courts, right? Our perspective is informed uh, by, by, our, by where we live and what we've been exposed to. Um, the top left graphic are SWAT rigs in Cincinnati, Ohio, by racial composition of the neighborhood. Um, the darker uh, neighborhoods here, 83 to 100% uh, black, uh, the white is, uh, is uh, no, no uh, blacks living in that area. Uh, the bottom slide, we have shootings um, by area. Again, uh, the darker number is 30 to 43, um, and it goes up from there. So as a kid, right, living in one of these areas, uh, this, is, this is interesting. So again, I just wanted to, so now we'll stop again, right, back to the opportunity map that we started with. And so now, we, you know, the question is, what does opportunity look like and how is it distributed? On some level, right, we have to understand it's distributed along racial lines. And again, not that folks are racist, not that, you know, there, there's this design of things, but institutions work to create racialized outcomes. And so we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the, the history of Cincinnati and why we think that is. So just one last slide uh, so you can see that. So um, well, how much time do we have? You're over, we need to start. <laughs> okay, so not much. Yeah. So, <laughs> I appreciate that, that's very, very well put. So, so why, why is this happening, right? So one of the perspectives we want to offer here is the socio-ecological model. And so this model says that individual decision making, in, in, on average, is probably the least important thing that's going to affect the life trajectory of someone. Why? Because we're under the umbrella of public policy, you know, our community influence, how we see things, our organizational uh, structures that we're involved with, and then also our interpersonal network. And so when we think about the kids we work with, um, so Josh and I work with kids that have, that have significant issues, right? Sometimes it's hard to, well, why are you doing this? Why, you know, please, you know, just, just listen to me. I'm, I'm going to tell Maybe they want to, right? Maybe the perspective, though, is, just, is, is, is inapplicable because of all these other, uh, these other frameworks you have to walk through. So I'll hand it over to Josh at this point. Thank you. 